Hey everyone, welcome back after what has been a, a really, really long uh, hiatus. Um, I'll go into the details of that at the end of the video for those who are interested. Long story short, uh, I had some serious medical complications and I was out of action for a couple of weeks and I'm only finally home now. Um, but now that I am home and slowly started to ease into it, what I wanted to do when I came back was a, a short video on a relatively easy topic um, before I dove back into uh, some very detailed Dominion's content that I think I'm going to have coming up hopefully in the relatively near future now that I'm back home. And the piece I wanted to do quickly was on Phoenix Point. So Phoenix Point, for those of you who haven't played it yet, is a game by Julian Gollop. It's not a AAA production. It was originally um, Fig Backer sort of crowdfunded, and then they got additional funding by uh, entering into an exclusivity agreement with Epic. But please do not go into the Epic deal stuff uh, on this on this video. Please just talk about the game itself. Um, that's an entirely different topic. Um, Phoenix Point, because it's by Gollop, um, doesn't have sort of the streamlining and polish that you'd expect of um, uh, the, the Newcom games that have come out of Firaxis in recent years. And it has instead the mechanical flavor of a game of the original XCOM UFO defense in terms of parts of how the Geoscape functions, particularly in terms of the fact that in tactical battles, all rounds are physics-based, individually simulated. You don't have percentage chances to hit in the same way you do in XCOM. And as a result, you need to get out of the old habits and deal with the, the, the nuance of it. Um, as a new release, it's still a little rough around the edges, but it's got an absolute core of brilliance to it. Um, and it has a Geoscape which plays very, very interestingly. And one of my great frustrations as I've started to play it in the last day or so is that this game doesn't currently have a very good wiki and there's a dearth of, or a mixed quality of content out there in terms of actually analyzing uh, the Geoscape as opposed to lots and lots and lots of Let's Plays of people playing through the game. So feel free to go watch those if you want to look at the game. I want to talk today specifically about managing uh, the Geoscape and particularly uh, the aircraft that are available to you um, in terms of the vehicles that actually carry your teams around the globe and allow you to respond to various threats, uh, what the pros and cons of those various aircraft are, how you should go about acquiring them, how I construct my teams and think about geospace response, noting that the game has been out for a couple of days and as a result this is a relatively early thinking on the meta. Um, and then I'll also, because that's a relatively short topic, we might touch on vehicles in Phoenix Point as well. So, really quick background before we talk about the vehicles that are available to you. The geoscape on Phoenix Point is a very, very large place. Um, it starts, it's, it's populated by locations and sites which you scan for and explore, as well as havens of the three factions in the game who you can attack, ally with, support, or just ignore uh, as you see fit. Um, at the start of the game, there's a relatively small area of the map covered by this red substance, this mist, which uh, is basically guarantees alien attacks on havens within it over time, but that steadily expands and more and more of the globe is placed under threat um, as time goes on. Um, aliens can build bases within the red mist that become visible after they attack a haven, which you can defend if you get there in time. Um, and defending havens is one of the great ways of getting significant rewards. So you'll see here there are 37 uh, havens of this faction, 42 of this faction, and 36 of this faction, which clearly means that there's probably been some casualties among um, Anu, because they, I believe, started my game with the most uh, individual havens, although they still have the most of the surviving global population. They're also independent um, havens, but they're just generally not as important. You have to interact with this geoscape in a variety of ways, and like any good management game in this sense, um, you're going to have, find your resources pulled in multiple directions at once. And one of the key differences between this and XCOM 2 is that you're managing multiple aircraft and multiple teams to try and respond to global events as opposed to just having the Avenger jumping around the globe. This geoscape is massive and takes a significant periods of time to get around. And if you are out of position, then you have to accept that you won't be in position to respond to a given threat. So what do we need to be doing at any given time on the Geoscape? Because this will inform what sort of team and aircrafts we need. Well, there's a couple of different things. We can be have aircraft that are out exploring, searching new sites, and that may mean getting ambushed. They need to have some sort of troops on board in order to handle that. You can have um, aircraft going and hitting alien bases. You can have aircraft out going and raiding um, other people's havens. You can have aircraft going around 
to friendly havens and doing trade. So you need to have an aircraft at a friendly haven in order to trade resources. So you might have aircraft doing that. You might also have aircraft going around picking up new recruits because in this game, you recruit units in havens, which means you need an aircraft present to trigger that recruitment. And they'll either get on the aircraft if there's room or they'll teleport to the nearest Phoenix base that you have unlocked and discovered and built up um, if necessary. So uh, alien base raiding, haven raiding, exploration, you could probably add in like main missions. So chasing around the globes, often going long distances because you won't start the game with anywhere near as much of the map revealed as I do. Um, in order to chase primary missions, you can still see there's one down here, which is still not in range for me. Um, because I haven't managed to make the bridge from Indonesia to Australia. Um, and you have aircraft playing taxi duty. And all of those can carry different numbers of teams um, and perform to different specifications. So I'm going to take you through the various sorts of aircraft that are available in Phoenix Point, uh, which ones I use for various uh, circumstances, uh, sort of address some of the problems I've seen in the advice that's been floating around on the Discord, although not everywhere. Some people seem to have the right idea as I see it. Um, how you get them, how you use them, etc. So I've actually unlocked all the aircraft in the game. So spoiler alert if you don't want to see this. Um, so the aircraft, sorry, I haven't unlocked manufacturing the final one, but I've got, uh, I've got one to show you. So every faction in the game plus Phoenix Point, so your faction, so all four, have one unique transport aircraft design. It starts, and they all balance a couple of traits. So let's use a Manticore, which is the one aircraft you start with in order to demonstrate. So the Manticore, and you see these traits down here. Um, these three matter, this one does not. So you start with the Manticore. Manticore can carry six troops or uh, three troops and one vehicle. Vehicles take up three slots. It travels at speed 500, this is just an arbitrary number, and then range 2000. Durability is how much damage it can take, but until the air combat DLC drops, the only way to take damage to an aircraft is from event, and no single event will destroy an aircraft in a single hit. So durability doesn't matter too much. So a Manticore is sort of our baseline performer. It carries six troops, 500, range 2000. That yellow ring you can see here is the range of an aircraft. Now, if you can get to any point within that range, you then refuel and can bounce off it. So if you've discovered this location, you can fly there, your range will refresh, and you can fly again. So at later in the game, range matters less because you'll have discovered lots of locations. Early game, however, range can matter immensely if you don't have time to scan or there's no sight, so you want to jump a location you couldn't normally jump. That's the Manticore. Let's compare it to the other aircraft that are available. Um, and I'll cover them in this order, um, the order of the click-through bar. And I think it's useful to look at the extremes first. The Tiamat is uh, the uh, Disciples of Anu airship, essentially. Um, so it's a dirigible. It's, uh, it's got significant engines on it, but still, it's a, it's a giant balloon. Um, the Tiamat is a really interesting vehicle in that I think it has great uh, usefulness early and mid-game and then I think it falls off significantly. Why? Because its capacity is 8 and 8 is a magic number for capacity uh, because most missions allow you to bring exactly 8 troops on them. So this, which you'll want to do if the mission might be hard, and this game has a, a difficulty spike function you'll find. Uh, the early game can be really quite easy but Unlike XCOM, where you out-tech the aliens, in this game, the aliens definitely out-tech you. So be prepared for difficulty spikes in the mid-game that will make large elements of what you did early game obsolete, make it impossible to bring rookies, and basically force you to rely on really determined use of abilities and the few technologies you do unlock to help counter their tactics to make it work. So this 8 capacity really matters. This range 4000 also matters immensely. You can see we are up here in North America, and we, if we had discovered this point, can bridge all the way into um, Eurasia. We can make it over to uh, Siberia. And so if early game you have missions that are out of range of what you have discovered, or you have a limitation of your ability to jump, and you don't have time or the ability or the resources to do area scans, Tiamats can give you range. However, 
tier mounts are frightfully slow. 250 means that you will take twice a... Sorry, one side effect of uh, my old drive being replaced is that I had to re-register Bandicam, otherwise things cut off after 10 minutes. Anyway, the 250 is frightfully slow. What this means is that if you've got an airship based, say, here, I've got one at base. Base locations are not fixed, by the way. And I'm looking at, say, responding if these havens get attacked. I may not get there before they're overrun. If I'm exploring, I'm going to explore many, many fewer sites given any unit time because the only thing that passes time is not the missions themselves, it's the transit to and from. So every time I need to move between sites and every time I need to come home and repair, refit, rearm uh, and rest my team is time wasted. And as time goes on, your doom meter uh, accelerates, the aliens adapt, the mist advances. Um, if you're not doing something, um, then you're really wasting your time. Or in the case of a response force, you're not making it there, so there's no point in having a bloody response force. So I've actually got my team out here retired. It's sort of in reserve at this point in the game because I'm relatively far along, I think. I'm not entirely sure. Um, we'll see. I didn't play the back of bills through to completion because I didn't want spoilers, but... Tier marks are good for serious objectives, base ratings, uh, things that are not time sensitive, strictly speaking. So you want to be fast, but you don't have to be. You want to bring a full team um, or they're out of range. And all of those things mean I think the tier marks one of the kings of the early game worth getting early on and then probably retiring as I have. I just wish I could deconstruct it for resources, which you can't do. Otherwise, I can imagine there'd be some exploits there less extreme than the Tiamat. So in every way, a dialed down version of the Tiamat is the new Jericho Thunderbird. So the Thunderbird is a quad, uh, quad rotor VTOL transporter. So what you've got here is a much lower range, but still longer than the Manticore, a capacity which is not perfect. So it's seven, not eight, and 380 speed. So faster than the Tiamat, but not as fast as a Manticore. However, I would argue that 7 rather than 8 makes a very significant difference, particularly in late game Haven defense. So this is a matter of, uh, I suppose, choice and balance, but I think the Thunderbird is the superior sort of response tool and a good general purpose offensive transporter. I like this. I like the Thunderbird for Haven raiding too, because I can raid reliably with 7. I don't want to bring 6, I want to bring 7. If you want to bring six, you can bring the Manticore. It's a matter of taste. I think the fight between the Thunderbird and the Manticore is up for grabs. That little bit of extra range helps, but probably isn't too significant. But you do get to bring a team of seven. And a team of seven, I think, is big enough on most missions, and it means you only need to use one aircraft for a mission. So that's the Thunderbird. Um, interesting note is that the Thunderbird is much more expensive than a Manticore to build, so I wouldn't build it, but we'll get into that in a bit. I wouldn't build any aircraft, to be frank. I built one Manticore because I was wanted it out quickly. The final aircraft design is um, a clear non-compromise option at the extreme, sort of one other extreme of the spectrum, but not really. The Helios 3 is a technological marvel, so it's a, it's a few, fourth generation hover design. Um, the Helios is produced by uh, Synedrion, so Synedrion, Synedrion, uh, I don't know, it's pronounced both ways depending on whether the character in question is Greek or not. Uh, certainly none of them are Australian, so I can't exactly copy it. The Helios is blisteringly fast. 650 is faster even than the Manticore. Um, you're getting like a 30% increase in speed, which is nothing to sneeze at and you're getting 3,000 range. So you're getting significant reach. However, you pay the price in seats, you go down to capacity five. Um, however, this means that the Helios is king of two duties. The Helios is absolute king of uh, just taxi duty. So where I go around recruiting people, pulling them back to base or going around trading, it's a fantastic runabout because it's fast. And for those things, you don't need much capacity. What you need is speed and range. And the Helios has those in undisputed quantities. So it's fantastic at that. The other thing is that, and this is something I see missed by a lot of people and by a couple of articles that have been put out by game journalists, is you can bring multiple aircraft to the same site and deploy troops from both in order to make your eight limit. So if, like me, you go and acquire a pair of Helios 
uh, aircraft. You can pair them and transport eight troops on them, or even more than that if you want to mix and match and have options, but I think troops are valuable enough that eight's enough. And in my case, what I've done is I've had the A-team on these uh, Helios transports, so they can hit priority sites. I've just destroyed a lair, and I can go hit an objective site next after I clear these two locations. Then I can sweep and get back to base and make the most out of my A-team, who are my most valuable soldiers. Soldiers are valuable in this game, particularly experienced and equipped soldiers. So getting them to where they need to go fast is something the Helios can do better than anything else. Just use a pair of them. How would I go about getting these aircraft? Well, you can build them, but they are mind-numbingly expensive. Uh, I did build a Manticore early game because I didn't have the capacity to get aircraft another way, and I really wanted a second team up ASAP. Um, you can build them. So 1,000 materials. The Helios is actually reasonably ex uh, inexpensive by comparison, but 825 materials, that's still going to be enough to kit out probably two soldiers to a reasonable level if you're making the materials. Certainly you'll be making ammo for a lot of the specialist weapons and grenades and lots of base upgrades. I would think of this in terms of three foregone, I'm not going to talk about base upgrades, but uh, this is three missed uh, farming upgrades that run your resources up and allow you to have something to trade beyond just what you loot. So that's expensive. The Helios is expensive even then. The Thunderbird, just, just don't even. I would not never build a Thunderbird um, unless you're showing off how rich you are. Um, so instead you steal aircraft. Aircraft can be stolen by going to a haven where one is parked. So you can see on the map where those aircraft are parked. Go in hit the steel aircraft button, and you go into a mission against the defenders, they will be heavily, heavily defended, um, and your mission objective is to get to the aircraft, uh, claim it, and then survive for five turns. Realistically, what that means is it's easier usually to clear the map than claim the aircraft. Uh, when the enemy's back is against the wall, they might start trying to shoot down their own aircraft in the hangar bay once the AI thinks it knows it's lost and it doesn't have any better options. Um, this is not. This is the one time where durability matters. Uh, the durability of the Thunderbird makes that sort of unlikely to happen. Whereas durability 80, only 80 on the Helios means that Synedrion troops can actually, uh, depending on what they're equipped with, preferably in their case laser rifles, uh, actually tear this thing down relatively quickly. So you want to move in uh, and do the damage before they can destroy them. Once you do that. Um, you take a minus 20 hit with the faction you steal it from, so you lose 20 opinion diplomatically. However, you gain uh, opinion in the other two factions, as with any other raid, based on how much those factions hate the faction that you're hitting. So the later in the game it gets, and the more the factions hate each other, which is the usual path but not the inevitable path of the game, uh, the more opinion you'll actually get from other people for stealing aircraft from the third. So. If you steal three aircraft, like say a Tiamat, a Thunderbird, and a Helios, then you're kind of mitigating the damage. Not super mitigating, but especially early game if you haven't unlocked the diplomatic gates to raise opinion past say 25 or 50 in factions. It might be worth taking one of their planes before you hit a lair, knowing you're going to bring it back up. Uh, and using that to build up your air force, your options. And what you can then do is you can, there are different approaches, but what I've done is I have a central hub base where most of my soldiers that aren't doing anything or are recovering are stockpiled, which has lots and lots of training uh, facilities that raise experience, I would say, faster than missions from my experience so far. Then you can have response teams at key parts of the globe. So I've got a Manticore down here with a full team of six. Um, I'm using that to respond to attacks in South America. There's also some training facilities as base, just not as many, and this team's already close to capped out. So they're basically a combination of reserve and a response team that can take down uh, attacks on these here to farm uh, rewards and experience. And I might set up another response team in other locations that are threatened. I also have my little runabout squad um, of two uh, transports that are carrying my A-team around who are hitting primary objectives. And the Thunderbird is going to come back in, pick up uh, seven troops that have trained up at this base, and those guys are going to go on a merry raiding trip across uh, enemy territory and clear out some of the sites I didn't have time to, while the response team stays at home. I also have another... Where is it? 
yeah, this manticore here is going to be the crux of the response team for these locations. Um, so while the Thunderbird is off hitting raiding locations and hitting sites, I'm going to I'm going to try and do base defenses with six troops, which I can usually pull off. I would just be a lot more comfortable with seven. So didn't want this to go long. Phoenix Point. Value strategic mobility, speed is important, so really the only aircraft that I consider, the, the clear aircraft that is undisputed in its role is the Helios. Um, I would get at least two of these guys if you can, because that allows you to transport a full team of eight troops around the world. Five is not enough. It's not enough to do most missions reliably, and you'll take more damage and have to fly home and uh, refresh more often, or you'll spend more on med kits. Or you'll have more destroyed items. It's just it's worth bringing more troops and really firepower using firepower to solve your problems. So two Helios is useful there. There's a point to be made for the Thunderbird as a raiding bird, uh, doing non-time sensitive raiding missions across territory. But the speed is still up there. The Tiamat um, I'll talk about last. The Manticore is a balanced entry. You have to use it at the start of the game. Six six guys is enough for some response missions. So. I use them because I've got them. It's a balanced choice. There's no real, there's no real argument against it strictly. But I would usually prefer to have, and this is personal preference. I would usually prefer to have seven troops in a Thunderbird than six in a Manticore. The Tiamat is the interesting one in that it has very obvious strengths and relative weaknesses. It's useful in the early game, certainly, because it got me places that I couldn't have gotten otherwise. It then started scans, which allowed other aircraft to follow after it and bridge those gaps. It can carry a full team, which means if you can only steal one aircraft early, and you might only be able to steal one aircraft early. You might only have the military capacity and take a beating stealing just one. And I actually think it also helps that Arnu is probably the easiest faction to beat up on. Um, if you're smart, I'd say Arnu is far easier to counter than the other factions. I would say that New Jericho is the hardest to raid, Synedrion's in the middle, and Synedrion probably has the best rewards and Arnu is the easiest. So I like stealing Synedrion, especially early games, stealing stuff from Synedrion's good. Um, later on, like New Jericho gear has more utility um, and it's less obvious, but in the early games, Synedrion gear is king. Um, so yeah, consider stealing a Tiamat as your first purchase, I think. Purchase, in inverted commas. Uh, that'll give you a team of eight that can go around the globe hitting priority missions, unlocking diplomatic gates, starting scans at far locations. But as soon as you can, you want to switch that out for, I would think, the dual Helios system of transporting units to locations in the fastest possible transport with long ranges. Um, the Helios is more than twice as fast more than twice as fast um, as the um, as the Tiamat. So, like, if you've got them, it's no competition. You get two aircraft per base, so I'm currently running six aircraft off five bases. There are six bases, I believe, in the game. No, there's eight. Jeez, okay, so there's more to find. So you could potentially run 16 aircraft. You won't need it. But at 16, you could easily have response teams. You could have every, almost everyone in a Helios plus the aircraft you just have collecting dust from earlier. That's all I wanted to say on aircraft. Uh, quick note on vehicle capacity. So vehicles take up three capacity um, and they don't cost as much as having three, um, three equipped troops. So the Scarab, which is probably, the Scarab is probably the best vehicle for mo as far as most people are concerned. Uh, the speeder is more of a sport vehicle and it's not worth the three slots. But if you are going to make a Scarab, um, bear in mind that I think that's only useful early game and only as a cost saving measure. So if you want to go to two teams early, you can bring a Scarab along to take up three spots and it's cheaper than having three fully equipped soldiers. But you'll find that later in the game, equipped soldiers it is better. So I would have my air teams comprised mostly of troops, but early game, um, if you have extra aircraft in particular, or if you're using a tier mark, but you don't have the troops available, uh, five plus a vehicle is a good com is a, is an acceptable combination, I would think. So having five troops in the aircraft and a scarab, or five troops uh, and an armadillo, as the case may be, um, there's arguments to be made for both of these. I think the general consensus is the scarab is in some ways preferable, but the armadillo has a case to be made for it. Uh, I haven't done enough with the um, the Synedrion vehicle. But truth be told, I would rather just have three medics. 
like three technicians than one vehicle doing healing with like dodgy armor like 50% less armor than everything else and fewer hit points so yeah anyway I'll leave that there I'm back um, for those of you that are interested um, I promised I'd talk about those personal circumstances so I had some pretty serious medical complications I was down for a couple of weeks um, I'm slowly easing my way back in there um, as I said while I was down um, some kind people who were looking to help me out um, went about doing some uh, fixes and changes on the PC um, the you know everything was done right in the sense that most of my drives are dismounted all my old gear that I was retaining was dismounted put in the new case etc however um, the SSD mounted on the MOBO uh, was a casualty in that process so I've lost all of my I've lost all my old recordings I've lost most of my saved games I'm trying to be very philosophical about it um, so I've lost my Hearts of Iron 4, I've lost most of my Dominion stuff, so everything that wasn't Llama server, so the Orm game, um, I still can download those old files and review them, um, but the Atlantis AA game, it's basically what I've got now, and I think one turn from a sub, so it may have to switch over to a summary mode, uh, which is unfortunate to say the least, but I'm trying to be philosophical about it. Um, I'll be back in my Sorry about that. Uh, I'll take that as a signal to wrap up. But uh, yeah, feeling a lot better now. But it was really, uh, it was really touch and go there for a while. Let's put, I couldn't speak for a while for one thing. Uh, it got pretty extreme. But I'm working my way back now. And excitingly, there should be a new Dominion's Five game coming up, featuring the new patch. Um, new games are always much easier to play than uh, existing games. So. I'll be slowly rebooting the ones, the game I'm already in, the uh, Atlantis game, but also at the same time, there'll be a new game coming up. Uh, and as always, I used a dice to select my nation. I considered, I considered overriding the dice and uh, picking Middle Age Bulba just for the lols, but there will be a new Dominions 5 coming up, uh, and I will be playing Middle Aged Relay as the dice have decreed. So more semi-aquatic amphibious action from me. Uh, hosted on General Confusion's channel uh, in a game that he has promised me will be uh, Mimi. Not sure if he's recording it, but I certainly will be. Uh, and I'll see you all again soon. Thank you very much, and it's good to be back.